or of course I'll be here next week. What I'm going to be speaking over the next five weeks, we're going to be dealing with refocusing on our mission and our vision statement. And our mission and vision statement is, you know, reaching the families of Pasadena uh, through love. Reaching for Jesus through love. Uh, living our victory every day. When we get to the second book, you can go back down, bro, see. But this one here, it, it's a refocus. Refocus on, that's not the heart, what well, you could say, that it's referring to the heart, but refocusing on love. So I want to be focusing on love in this place this morning. About two years ago, uh, Wanda, various other leaders of the church, and myself, we started a thing called 24 to Double. And during that time, we, we were attending these different sessions, and they were going through different other types of formats and things to try to teach you some church growth. And, and during that time, at the very beginning of that, they began to encourage you and, and um, to begin to develop a mission and a vision statement. And as I was seeking the Lord back then, and I still believe it's true today, if not more so, I believe it's even more so true for us today, and so much more vital for us today as a church to do this. And, and I do believe this is the vision and the way that the Lord wants us to go with our church about reaching the families of Pasadena for Jesus through love. And, and remember, love there, we gotta, we're going to be talking about the actual word love this morning, but by that love there, we're using it as an acronym to mean living our victory every day. And I think it's so vital that we as a church do that. One thing if you have not realized about me yet after almost, you know, it's been two and a half years now I've been here, actually. In no November, November the 1st, and actually November 2nd will be three years that I've been the pastor of your church. One thing if you have not realized it about this about me already is the fact that I try to be, and I hate this people say, I'm keeping it real. That's not what I'm saying. I try to be real life to people. I don't try to put on a show. The way you see me here is the way I'm at home. Uh, again, you should be able to guess that by just some of the statements sometimes that fly out of my mouth while um, I'm preaching. People go, a preacher said that? Well, if it, if, it, if it wasn't obscene or something like that, don't worry about it, okay? Obscene aren't going to come out anyway. But I need to clarify that for you. But I, I just, I, I truly am in my life about just being and just... What does it really mean to follow God every day? What does it mean to be a Christian every day? Because, you know, I don't want to be a person that just comes to church on Sundays and I'm hooping and hollering and all this stuff, but yet I have nothing else when I go home. I have nothing when I leave this place. Because if what God has done in my life can't, can't truly keep me and do something for me the rest of the week, I'm not going to waste my time in church. See, this is coming from somebody. I was raised in church. Right? I was in church before I was born. But, you know, I was the last of eight. My dad, my dad was a pastor. The fact is, my first brother, the first child of theirs that was born as a preacher's kid was actually their fifth child. My brother that's next to me in age, which is ten years older than me, there's two sisters between us. He was number five, I'm number eight. He was the true first pastor's child. So, as far as all I have ever known in my life is church. And again, that can be a good thing. That can be a bad thing. Because I've seen people in their life, I've seen kids raised in church, and guess where they are today when they're an adult? They're not here. I've seen kids that have been raised in church, and guess where they are today? They are here. You know, it can be a good thing, it can be a bad thing. A lot of it depends, I think, again, I'm not trying to poke on anybody's parents, or I'm just simply telling you, a lot of it has to do with your family. I think it does have to do with whether or not, truly, if, what they're, if they're seeing at home what they're seeing in church. Sometimes, sometimes that doesn't make a difference, and, and I understand that. But one thing I'll tell you, I know from my own personal experience, what my mom and dad were in front of the church people, that's what they were at home. If I got in trouble for doing it at church, I got in trouble for doing it at home. Okay, you know, um, if, if they worship God in church, guess what? They worship God at home. They prayed in church, they prayed at home. You know, what my parents were in church, that's what they were at home. And what they were at home, they were in church. And that's the same thing to me. You say, well, and again, that, that's just me. This is who I am. If you don't like it, sorry about your love. If you do, well, I like you too. No, I like you too. But, uh, <laughs> but I think it is so important for us to make sure what we're doing is very consistent and, and, and honest. 
you know, that, that the life that we live is something truly that we live every day. And, and with that being said, you know, as we get into, as we get into this thing, we're going to look at, you know, two years ago, I actually did a series of messages on this. And, um, and then I've dealt with some different things on that, but I'm going to be looking at it a little bit different as we go into it now to refocus on this. See, but it's not enough for us just to have a mission and vision statement. You need to know that how we're going to accomplish this and how we're going to accomplish what God has birthed in my heart. You may ask, why the state of the families of Pasadena? Why didn't I say everybody? Because again, two years ago when I did the research, and I'm sure it hasn't changed too much, in Pasadena, 61% of the people that make up Pasadena are families. It, it, it's married couples. And that's actually above the national percentage. So you know, and if the people are married, usually they're going to have a family. They're going to have children. So our focus needs to be trying to reach those families. See, but, but in doing that, though, we do reach everybody else, too. We're, it's not that we're excluding or, or ignoring anybody, but we will reach them through that. But in order to do that, uh, we must become, as I put it, a church of actions, which means a church of acts. And, and our, our basis that we use for this uh, scripture um, is found in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 44, just talking about how the church every day would dealt each other. And in fact, if you look at our welcome card, it just sort of has a, a little thing there. It simply says, if you're in, you in search of a church that teaches and preaches and believes the whole Bible, and the power and works of the Holy Spirit, then you will love our church. We believe the best way that we can impact our families of our communities by living our victory every day, love. People are searching for something that is real, something that, that, that they can connect with and believe in. So as a group of believers in Jesus, so we as a group of believers in Jesus strive to live our lives in such a way to bring the concepts of the Bible to real life in everyday living. Jesus is still the answer for all of your cares and problems. And we would love the opportunity to share with you how you can experience and live this love and victory every day. Hope to see you soon. That's our invitation card. That's what if you know, if you want to let people know a little bit about who we are. I think there's still some in the back. I'm going to be printing some up here in a little while and put them back there. But that is just a little sense of that's how I view things. It's something that, that we need to do every day. But as we get into these series of messages, I'm going to say, well, how do we answer? We, I'm going to ask you some questions about love, about living our victory every day. So, so the question we're going to look at over the next four weeks, once we're finished this message today, is what is meant by living? What does it mean now? Well, what do we mean by that? What is meant by living? Remember, we're talking about living our victory every day. What is meant by our? What is meant by victory? And what is meant by every day? So over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at this and concentrating on seeing see, what does it truly mean to fulfill this type of life, this type of mission, this type of vision in the life of people you come in contact with. Because I do believe it's, it's something that we must do every day. And here's one thing I want to tell you right off the bat. No one in this room, under the sound of my voice, is going to live a perfect life every day of their life. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. But here's the thing about it. Our salvation doesn't depend on us. It depends on Him. He is the one that when we go to Him, if, if we mess up, we can say, Lord, I'm sorry. I messed up. And guess what? He will give you forgiveness. Now, with that being said, that does not give you a free license just to go out and do whatever you want and say, well, I'll just get forgiveness after I do it. No, that, that, that's not what I'm talking about either. I'm just simply telling you that he, He's given you the ability to live a victorious life. But sometimes, life. How, how many of you want to admit this? Sometimes we get a little pig-headed. Sometimes we get a little stubborn. Sometimes we decide we want to do things what? Our way. And all of a sudden, when we do things our way, we realize, oh dear, and when it's all said and done, we go, why did we just listen to you in the first place? And we begin to kick ourselves in the butt. And sometimes you need to kick yourself in the rear end. You notice I changed my word up there. I just said it the first time. <laughs> but you don't need to always beat yourself up. But again, that's something we're going to get into a little bit later on. Huh. But in order to accomplish love, in order to accomplish living our victory every day, it cannot be done without love. Without the actual word love. And right as we get ready to get ready 
continue the rest of this. I have a short little video clip I want you to watch that's called This is Love. This is love. This is love. This is love. For God so loved the world, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God is love. God is love. This is how we know what love is. Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ laid down his life for us. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He loved me. How great is the love the Father has lavished upon us, that we should be called children of God. He loves me. Be imitators of God, therefore, and dearly love children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. He loves me. And now these three remain. And now these three remain. Faith hope and love but the greatest of these but the greatest of these is love he loves me 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 Dr. Weston, as we were going through 24 to double, said this about the church. He says, the church should be the closest thing to heaven as there is on earth. The closest thing to heaven. And as I was listening to that video and I was watching it, if you ask most people what they thought about church and what they thought about God, how many of them would say that God is love? How many of us say the church is love? I mean, honestly, I really want you to think, think, think about what I'm telling you this morning. Most of the time, when you mention church, the people, the first thing that, that they begin to tell you is they begin to tell you about, they talk about judgment. Hypocrites. Finding fault. Gossip. But in all honesty, if you really look at what Christ came here to do and what everything what we're supposed to be as a church, when people think, when people think of El Bethel Community Church, they need to think about love. And again, and, I, and I'm not saying that, that we that whatever we do, that we ignore every type of sin that's going after, but there's there's a way to do things. And I'm here to tell you the church for a long period of time has done things the wrong way. Because, you know, the church has tried to become a political element. They try to do this and do that. And I'm here to tell you, if only the church would truly be the church that God called her to be, then we wouldn't have to worry about what's going on with our government because we'd be down on our knees praying for our government and the government would be operating the way it's supposed to. Why? Because God would be listening to what? For some our heart. mouths. I'm not here to beat up on you, but I just want you to understand this morning what we are called to do, what we are called to be as children of God. And when I'm talking about this mission of love, living our victory every day, it must be done in the spirit of love. So what is love? Let's look at this definition. I brought it up again. I've talked about this several times, but I want to look at this again. So again, what is the definition of love? Love is unselfish, loyal, and benevolent concern for the well-being of another. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul describes love as a more excellent way. More excellent than tongues or even preaching. The New Testament maintains this, estima this estima estimation of love throughout. The King James Version uses the word charity instead of love to translate the Greek word Paul, uses, Paul used agape. The 
word charity comes from the Latin. Uh, I had to pull this out. Didn't I? Caritas, which means dearness, affection, or high regard. And literally, agape literally means also a love feast. And what I mean, that doesn't mean orgy, okay? I'm just telling you real quick. That, that, that doesn't mean go, oh yeah! No, no, okay? It means to truly have what an attitude of love. It's just a spirit and an attitude and a nature of love inside you. But this is what love is. And as you saw in the video, the Bible simply says too what that God is love. But you know, when people think of the church, do they think of love? Do they think it's a place where they can come in and be accepted? See, the problem is, it's like we talked about, remember one of the same songs, Jesus doesn't care. And I told you, you do not have to clean yourself up before you come to Jesus. But the sad part is, most churches, you've got to clean yourself up before you walk through those doors. That's right. People need to be able to walk through that door the way they are. And I'm going to simply take, like for instance, I'm, 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 I'm going to make some statements here right now. According to the Bible, and I believe in the Bible, the bottom line is that homosexuality is a sin. But that does not mean if a homosexual comes to that door, I'm not going to let them come. I want them to come through that door. Mm -hmm. I want them to come because I want to be able to just show them the love of Christ. Because guess what? God loves them. Jesus loves them. Jesus died for them. A drug addict, a drug addiction, they're, they're sins. I mean, they're, they're things that are going to hold you. They're, they're going to send you to hell because drug, drug addiction goes on with drunkenness. We know drunkenness is a sin. But the thing is, I want the alcoholic, I want the drug addict to come through that door. They don't have to clean themselves up and come before there. Because the bottom line is, I can't clean them up. Anything they do can't truly clean them up. What happens is when they meet this one named Jesus Christ at this altar, He's the one that can come in and change their lives. He's the one that can come in and help them realize that they don't need that anymore. He's the answer, not us. We need to show them the answer. We need to show them Him through us. And when they look at us, the first thing they need to see in us is love. They need to see an attitude and a spirit of love. Now again, by saying that, I'm not saying that you wink at everything that goes by. But I'm also saying that, that you're not sitting there and get on about everything they do. Because the bottom line, if they're not a Christian, how do you expect to win it for the Lord if all you ever do is, is getting on? They know they're bad. They know what they're doing is not right. How are you helping them out telling them any more about it? They need to truly see the love of Christ, a love that will reach out to them where they are. And let them know, you know what? I still love you anyway. Again, because that's going to get us into what we're talking about in 1 Corinthians 13. Again, I told you, I love, I love how the message puts this. Because I'm here to tell you, if you, if you don't understand it here, you must be the dumbest person on earth. And here's what I mean. I believe the message puts things out here very, very plain. If you don't get it after reading it here, you know, sometimes, you know, we read some of the older versions of the Bible and we sort of scratch our heads. This is one of these portions of Scripture that's done in a modern translation where I don't think it really leaves any room for the imagination to think of what you need to understand about it. And, and, and if you don't get it, you're denser than granite. <laughs> All right. 1 Corinthians. And if you don't understand what I said, granted it's pretty hard and dense stuff. Okay? Alright, there we go. <laughs> Means you're awful hard headed, good kid. No, 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 Alright. Again, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 8. And you need to understand something. Again, it doesn't matter what we say we are as Christians. If there truly is not a spirit of love in us, you're wasting your time. You're not going to reach anybody. Now again, I'm not trying to sugarcoat this so much. And I'm not trying to say you've got to be so loving W for people that you never live the standard. That's not what I'm telling you. But the thing is, you need to live the standard. And let them see where you stand. And in that spirit of love. And, and then if you can say, you know, why when tragedy begins, you're talking about the toolbox, the, the, the trauma toolbox and all that. Why is it when tragedy happens? Why is it 
you can still have a song in your heart. You can still go on. You know, if it was me, I don't know what I would do. But see, but that's when they need to understand. Truly, greater is He that is in me. There is someone. There, 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 there is a Savior that is living inside of me that has given me the strength to go on when I didn't think I could take another step. Because it's not me doing on my own. But it's the one who says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's the one that is with me through all of this. See, our talk is cheap. they got to see what we're living in a life of action. But let's go ahead and go into this. If I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I am nothing of the creaking of a rusty gate. Now, Anybody here have, have either a gate or a door at home that as soon as you... How many of y'all love that sound? Raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> All right. How many of y'all think that sounds irritating? Raise your hand. Yeah. So guess what? That means if you're not living the way first says that, it means you're irritating the people. It's not something that's harmonious in their ears. It's not something that's pleasing in their ears. It's not even it's something that's attractive in their ears. Because what the, the Jesus tells them, we're to be salt. We're to be the salt of the earth. What does that mean? Salt, if you, if you eat stuff, can you know, have you ever noticed, like for instance, uh, Texas Roadhouse. They give you something to eat when you come in. What's, what's the thing they give you? There's peanuts, right? Well, well why, why, do you think, why do you think those places, and even like bars, have peanuts and all that stuff sitting on the counter? What does it make you... If you eat them peanuts, what do you become? Thirsty. Why are you becoming thirsty? Because the peanuts have what on them? Salt. Salt. And salt makes you what? Makes yeah. you thirsty. Makes you want to drink. So then figure that thing. You know, thirsty? Sell more drinks. Folks, it's no difference with us. The Bible says that we're the salt of the earth. What well, our life is supposed to be something to make somebody thirsty, somebody want what we have. And if people aren't asking you about what's different about you, I mean, some of us are just weird freaks anyway, so like myself. So they just, you know, he's different. They may not say, what's different about this year? He is different. Um, but if they're not wondering what's different about you, I think you sort of need to look at your life. And especially if they're, not, if, they're, if they're not asking, you know, how can, how can I get what you have, how can I experience what you're experiencing? We're called to be salt. We're called to be something to be attractive. But it says, if I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, that means you can have the voice of an angel. I mean, I saw that, uh, there, there, there's a new commercial with uh, Neil Patrick Harris where he has a little background card going, yeah. you know, the, and then all through the, well, that's the only song they know, he says. But you know, they, they can have a voice, voices of angels. You know, all this stuff. You know, they, they, they can speak with eloquence, eloquence like crazy. But the Bible says, if we don't love, we're just an irritating noise. We're, our, our voice is worth nothing. Then it continues to say in verse 2, it says, if I speak the word of God with power. Now, now really listen to what it's saying here. If I speak God's word with power, power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day. And if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, I'm going to stop there a second. Now I'm here to tell you, most of us in here, if we've been in church any amount of time, if we see this in the life of a person, or we see this See that and all that stuff. We're like, man, I wish I could be like them. And, and again, I'm not belittling it. Don't, don't misunderstand me this morning. This needs to be showing up in your life. The first verse, you need to speak. You know, God loves you. Speak with that angelic voice. Speak with, with, with that human eloquence. Have, have the ability to, to proclaim God's word with power, to reveal his mysteries and making everything in place. Let God do that kind of thing in your life. But the whole point is, but if I don't love, I'm nothing. So it doesn't matter how much you speak in tongues. It doesn't matter how much you roll on the floor. It doesn't matter all the stuff you may say you know about God and what you experience about God. If love is not the ruling factor in your life, 
it doesn't do you any good. See, a lot of times, oh man, we, we like the stuff that shows on the outside. We, we, we like, we, we like the, the um, 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 people whacking people on the head, seeing them saying, hey, I believe in all this stuff. I want to see it. And that, that, that happens. So again, like I said, don't misunderstand me. I am not belittling it. I am not preaching against it. I'm saying this is what we need to have, but without love, it doesn't do us any good. Without love, all we're doing is, is exalting self. We're not truly exalting God. And it doesn't stop there. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr. I mean, th those are things that honestly as Christians, we should do. But I don't love. I've got nowhere. So, no matter what I say, what I believe, what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Jesus tells a parable of two men praying. They go to the temple and pray. One is a Pharisee. One's a tax collector or who we refer to as, if you say, a sinner. Because they figured, I almost want to say amen to this, you know, the Bible times to say, anybody's a tax collector or the devil, but if you work for the comptroller's office here this morning, I'm not calling you a devil, I just sort of, you know, or you work for the IRS, I'm just, no one likes to pay taxes to the government, but it's just goes good. So I'm just using it as an example, okay? Uh, but the Pharisee, he gets up there and he begins to pray. He says, Father, or God, whatever, for you, my brother Kent, and all just know the sort of what he's talking about. He says, I thank you that I'm not like this sinner over there. <laughs> That I don't blah 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 blah, but I do blah 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 blah. blah. And, and literally, that's what God hears once He starts to say that. It's you know, womp womp. <laughs> Charlie Brown. <laughs> all the kids, all the adults ever talk. See, you never realize they stick it in a commercial. You know, the car commercial about the parents are in there looking at a minivan, the kids with them, the salesman's talking. And the salesman begins to describe to the parents what, what's in the minivan. Mm -hmm. And so you, you first hear the salesman talk to, to, to the parents. And then they, they take it over and say, this is what a child hears. You hear, womp, 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 DVD player, womp, 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 womp. <laughs> and as soon as you hear DVD player, the kid goes, huh? Oh, what? <laughs> you know? But that's what it is with God a lot of times. With that Pharisee, that's what it was. Because as soon as he started, what? Talk about himself, how wonderful he is, how great he is. In God's, in God's ears, it's like, womp, 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 blah, 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 blah. But yet the center over here, the Bible says, he wouldn't even lift his eyes up to heaven. And Jesus said, he just smote himself on his chest and said, Lord, have mercy on me. A sinner. And Jesus looked at his disciples and says, I tell you surely that this sinner walked away a whole lot more justified than this so-called righteous man. And then what I'm trying to tell you here, it doesn't matter what we think of ourselves. It matters what he thinks of us. We, we, we can do a lot of things. And I, and I, told, and I told him this, this past Wednesday night in class. You know, it's not really so much what you do, but why you do what you do. It's more the attitude behind what you do. Again, when I'm saying this, I'm not giving you like, okay, well, if I'm doing the right attitude, it means I'm going to do something wrong. And woo, I'm okay. No, that's not what I'm telling you. Okay? But what I'm telling you, if you're doing something right with the wrong attitude, it doesn't do you any good. So it's more the attitude behind what we do. That's why this love thing is so important. And that's why, you know, it says so no matter what I say, what I believe, what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Without love, we're worthless as Christians. Without love, we're not doing anybody.
anybody any good. We're doing more harm to the kingdom of God than we are doing good. I don't care what you're doing in your life. I don't care how much you speak in tongues. I don't care how many healings you supposedly have in your life. I don't care how many people you may have laid your hands on and then gone out of the spirit. I don't care how much you understand about the Bible. I don't care about any of that. If you truly are not loving people, it's not doing you any good as a child of God. Then he goes on in verse 4. It says, love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. I mean, listen to this stuff. It doesn't give up. It cares more for others than for self. It doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. It doesn't have a swelled head. And I'm here to, and I'll tell you, some of this stuff, especially if you're not careful, these are easy things to develop. How many know it's very, it's very easy, especially if you're good at something, to start to think you are something? Oh, yeah, man. It's like, uh, <laughs> I can pick on this because I know kids that play video games. I, I know kids who, uh, who, who, who brag about <coughs> how good they are. Like, man, yeah, all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, they run into that one person who's better than them, that person kicks their derriere. Well, <coughs> um, yeah, um, <coughs> it's amazing what excuses they come up with to... to, to for, for having their rear ends kicked in that game. Huh. But when you begin to think that you're something, the Bible says when you think that you're something, when you're nothing, what do you do? You deceive yourself. It's dangerous. See, and it's easy to begin to fall into this. It's, begin to, it's easy to be able to fall into to thinking that you're something. But it doesn't have a swelled head. Doesn't force itself on others. Isn't always... Me first. And I'm here to tell you, as a Christian, if it's you first, you definitely got things out of order. The only thing in your life that should be first over anything else in your life is your relationship with God. Okay? But as far as that goes, in a Christian's mind, God's first, others second, yourself is last. That's the way your attitude should be. If it's not that way, you got your priorities mixed up somewhere. Well, Pastor didn't preach what I wanted to preach today. But the praise team didn't sing what I wanted to sing. But the teacher didn't teach what I wanted to teach. Nah, nah, nah. When has it been about you? It's about him. And if we truly keep him center focused, guess what? You'd be a little bit happier in your life. You'd be able to find him you're a whole lot more effective, too. Let me stop. Am I beating you up this morning? I'm not trying to. I'm just, I'm just trying to, to, to just help you understand some things. There, there are some attitudes in the church, and I do. I praise God that, that truly what I'm preaching this morning, this really isn't a problem that our church has, but it's also a problem that we don't want to what? Get. Or develop. Or become. So, so I'm here to tell you, if I see you do this, remember you a couple weeks talking about jack slapping people? <laughs> you see me coming behind you, watching the back of the head. You know, well, you went that no, <laughs> uh, I was telling somebody after that message, I said, "Man, I have to be careful." The people are saying, "I need to be careful." I do wrong, Pastor. You're a jack slap. <laughs> <laughs> Those are just figures of speech. Sometimes in yourself, you really would like to do that, but don't worry, I won't. Okay. I'll mentally just beat you to death, but don't worry about it. No. Uh, but again, love isn't always me first. It doesn't fly off the handle. Doesn't keep a score of the sins of others. Doesn't revel when others grovel. And I'm here to tell you, that one can be a tough one. Because if you've ever been wronged, in your life by somebody, raise your hand. Or if you felt like you've been wrong. And I tell you, in yourself sometimes, all of a sudden when things aren't going right for that person that wronged you, now let's be honest, so I'm going to get ready to raise my hand too. When things happen to them, you're so like, yeah, they deserve it. If you felt that way, raise your hand. Now, I'm not raising my hand to say just to be an example. I'm raising my hand because that's the way I felt. Okay? <laughs> so again, I'm here to tell you, I, I, I've been down that road. But the Bible tells us with love, love doesn't grovel, love doesn't revel. 
when others rob. I'm telling you, the human side sometimes, you're like, man, roll around in that mud just a little bit more. <laughs> oh, God, put, put, your, put your foot on her head and sort of squish it down and for me. If you don't mind, Lord, I'll do it myself. You know? <laughs> now, okay, I know you love it, but let's be honest. How do you felt that way? The bad thing is, that's been recently. I'm saying that's where His grace is sufficient. <laughs> but the thing, but see, but see, but the thing is, see, but it, it is human to think that way. Sir. And sometimes those type of thoughts come into our mind. But the thing is, when they do, that's when all of a sudden, it truly, if we do have a spirit of love within us, we also we can say, Lord, what am I thinking? You know, I know that's not supposed to be the way I'm looking at this. As much as I'd like to see them. Lord, I really don't truly want anything really bad happen to them. Because here, how many of y'all want to know? Here's the thing. Even though that happens, I mean, you really, let's, let's cut through all the mess. Jesus died for them too. And the thing is, if they get saved, guess what? You're going to spend eternity together. Let you say, oh, dear Lord Jesus, send me to hell now. No. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, no. Send them to hell now. <laughs> Yes, amen. <laughs> but honestly, that is where truly the spirit of Christ comes into play. That is where the spirit of love really comes into play. When he comes into your heart and your life, he can literally change how you feel about somebody. Amen. He can change how you feel about a situation. Why? Because it's no longer you, but it's him living in you. And the thing is, the more you hang out with him, the more you become like him. The more you take on his nature. That's why it's so important to get yourself rooted and grounded in the word of God. That's why it's so important to take it in. That's why it's important to get together truly with like-minded believers like we are here today so we can sit there and encourage one another and build each other up so we can see the example of who Christ is and see it in his word. And then once we get around that, it begins to become a part of who we are. And see, that even though things go wrong, and sometimes you're going to get mad. I'm here to tell you Jesus got mad, but he didn't sin. Sometimes we're going to get angry, but the thing is, we don't need to sin over it. And if you do, then you say, Lord, I messed up. Forgive me. And you press on and try to make things right. Okay? But, but again, love doesn't revel when others grovel. As much as we'd like to take pleasure in it. Okay? But love takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. Puts up with anything. Trust God always. Always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps on going to the end. Love never dies. You say, Pastor, that, that's all great and dandy, but you know, how do we really know that that's really for us? Well, let me tell you. John chapter 13, verses 40, 40, verses 34 through 35 says this. This is Jesus talking. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have loved one for another. If you remember several months ago, you haven't heard too much about them in the news lately, but if you remember up until um, one of them, I think, got beat up and no, no one in town came to their defense, um, Westboro Baptist Church, you know what I'm talking about? The ones who like to go and pick it at the funerals of soldiers and all this other stuff. I'm here to tell you, is is. When I read the Bible, they're the father's thing for being a Christian. Amen. Of, what it, Amen. of what I can read the Bible. They, they literally, if you've actually gone to their site, I mean, if you want to check them out again, if you, I'm a little scared of something to tell people to check some of this stuff out because if, if you don't know what you're looking at, it can mess you up because people can, you know, because they actually take scripture and they twist it around. It's like they take the verse, John 3.16, they say, you know, they say all the rest of the Christian churches are preaching this verse wrong. Because, you know, as a Christian church, why do we talk about God's love? Because John 3.16 says what? For God what? For God so loved the world that he gave his one only begotten son. And of course we say that world represents who? Everybody. But on their website they say, no, it doesn't. It represents the call, the chosen. And I'm like, Exactly. <laughs> you should hear their voice now. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, 
It, 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 it's nuts. I mean, they, they, they teach a spirit of hatred and legalism. Mm -hmm. And see, and, and I understand it because when you get into legalism, hatred will naturally follow. But when you sit there and try to be self-righteous in what you're doing, like, like, like the Pharisee that says, Oh Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this person. See, there's a difference. Say, Lord, thank you that I'm not going through what others are going through. Now, now you've got to be careful about that because sometimes all of a sudden you can find yourself going through it. But you know, but if it's truly a spirit of being thankful instead of pride, see, see, th 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 there's a difference there. But this church that they take and twist around and say, well, it just means the chosen. But I'm here to tell you, that, that is contrary to Scripture. That is utterly contrary to Scripture. And they mess it up so much. And yet, but the thing is, how many of those people don't want to follow whacked out people? And that's what they do. You know, the, the people who. Well, that's that's a whole other thing. Yeah, but but again, it's, but, it's, but again, it's a spirit of love, as as Christ Himself. You know, do you realize when Jesus was on this planet, He never truly ever said a harsh word to any sinner. He never rebuked a sinner while He was on this planet. Do you know that? Well, if, it, if you know of any place in the Bible right now where Jesus rebuked a sinner, you tell me. But I will tell you, I can tell you, point out Scripture where Jesus rebuked the self-righteous, where He rebuked mm -hmm. the religious. Mm -hmm. He called them all white and holes. People, a, a, a grave full of dead bones, a casket full of dead bones, and all that stuff. That's what He told to the religious people of the day. The ones who, who the Pharisees said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this sinner. Man, he got on them like crazy. But, but to the people who were truly sinners, what he offered them was forgiveness and the true way to the Father. But life didn't have to keep on going the way that it was going. Now see, again, he didn't, he didn't say, oh, you're just okay just the way you are. That keeps you That's not what I'm saying. Okay? But he lived a life of love in front of them and always offered them forgiveness. <coughs> And he showed that there truly was something different about himself. And that's what we must do as a church. We must show them that there's something different about us. Again, a new commandment I give to you. That you love one another as I love you. That you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So again, even as the body of Christ, there needs to be a spirit of love and a, and a, and a community of love that is what within this building here, within this body here. There needs to be that spirit of love. Without that, it benefits us nothing. But I need to get through this real quick here. I want to read from, from Luke, Luke chapter 6. This thing here. Huh. Again, I'm reading this from the message. I love how the message put this. Luke chapter 6, 6, 30 and verse 27. I'll try to get through this very quickly. To you who are ready for the truth. I'm going to stop there a second. So don't look, don't read any further. Just stop on that line. If you're ready for the truth in this building this morning, raise your hand. If not, you better keep it down. I'm probably gonna, I'm gonna whack myself between the eyes too, so don't worry about it. All right? To you who are ready for the truth, I say this. Love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. And I gotta stop there a second. Again, Sarah, she's one of our service women. And the thing is, it's because of them we live in a free nation. But, with that being said, nothing about them, about us now. We must make sure we never take on an attitude that we begin to hate the Muslims. That we begin to hate people that are different from our faith. Because you know what? They need Jesus Christ. Now again, we don't uphold them in, 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 in serving Allah. That's not what I'm saying. But we cannot take on the spirit and attitude of hatred towards them. They must know that there is a Jesus who loves them. A Savior who loves them. And we will be that example for them. In fact, we're going to get into that here real quick. So I just wanted to say that real quick. We, we, we've got to be very careful. Because it's so easy to develop attitudes of love and hatred towards people who are truly what we consider to be detestable in our society. Whether it's a child molester, whether it's a racist, whether it's a murderer, whether it's a mass murderer, whatever it is. Believe me, justice needs to be done. Okay, I believe I, I, I believe mass murders and murders should be killed. I, I believe that. I believe in capital punishment. I believe rapists should be killed. 
Okay, I'm, I'm just telling you. Child, child molesters. I'm an idiot. Take him out, put a gun to the back of your head, pull the trigger. I'm, I'm just, and again, I'm just giving my own personal thing. But with that being said, they also need the love of Christ. Mm -hmm. How do you love the love of Christ? And again, what what is a personal view of what I would like to see done, and what I would actually do, are two different things. Okay. What, what, what in the human side of me would really like to see done, and surely what the love of Christ compels me to do, is two different things a lot of times. But to you who are ready for the truth, I say this. Love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with energies of prayer for that person. If someone slaps you in the face, stand there and take it. If someone grabs your shirt, gift wrap your best coat and make it, make a present of it. If someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit for tat stuff. Live generously. There's a simple rule of thumb for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you. Then grab the initiative and do it for them. Ooh. That is so much different than what our world is being taught, isn't it? Mm -hmm. See, this is the type of message that needs to be coming from the church, but is this the message that is coming from the church? If you only love the lovable, do you expect a pat on the back? Run of the mill sinners do that. If you only help those who help you, do you expect a medal? Guard variety sinners do that. If you only give for what you hope to get out of it, do you think that's charity? The stingiest of pawnbrokers does that. I tell you, love your enemies, help and give without expecting a return. You'll never, I promise, regret it. <clears throat> Live out this God-created identity the way our Father lives towards us, generously and graciously, even when we're at our worst. Again, when you understand, He allows the sun what, to shine on the just and the unjust. He allows the rain to fall upon the just and the unjust. God's love is unconditional. Like I said, His love is unconditional, but His promises are not. But God loves everyone. Our Father is kind. You be kind. Don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. Don't condemn those who are down. That hardness can boomerang. Be easy on people. You'll find life a lot easier. Give away your life. You'll find life giving back. But not merely giving back. Giving back with bonus and blessing. <coughs> giving and not getting is the way. Generosity begets generosity. I don't have the time to go over all of this. But this needs to be our attitude. This needs to be our heart. This needs to be our heartbeat. It's so easy for us to come together in our little Holy Ghost huddles, our church huddles, and just pat it about back. Don't get begin. I'm not poking fun at it. Because we need to do that. But we truly need to let people see the love of Christ in our lives. And they need to see it each and every day that we live. We're going to get into this stuff more and more as time goes on. I know what I read. It's not easy. It's not easy to think this way. It's not easy to behave and act this way. But Jesus said in Luke 6, To you who are ready for the truth, I say this. Like I said, I know it's not easy. But if we are truly going to be the children of our Heavenly Father and brothers and sisters of Jesus, 
we must be this way. And in closing, I know there's another scripture verse I had up there, but it's okay. I'm going to close out with John, 1 John, chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. And Steve, if you don't mind, I'm going to, I'm going to just, just very softly play some music in the background for me. It says, Dear children, let us not merely say that we love each other, but let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. So we'll be confident when we stand before God. We stand for this morning. How are we going to accomplish this vision? How are we going to accomplish this mission? How are we going to reach our family? How are we going to reach our friends, our co-workers? How are we going to reach this community? This reach the families. First and foremost, it must be done in an attitude, in a spirit, and in a life of love. And the thing is, you may say, well, Pastor, I, I, I just, I, I don't know how to do that. Well, let me just tell you this. All you have to do is just say, Lord, help me become more like you. Because you can simply know that's true because he says, the word says, God is love. And because he's love, we can experience his love. See, but the problem is, when we allow things to come in and begin to hold us back and tie us down, that begins to take up room where his love can fill, where his love can overwhelm, where his love can come in and just flood into our lives. We gotta be willing a lot of times to let some stuff go. So God can truly be God in our lives. If we're gonna reach this world, if you're gonna reach your family, you're gonna reach your co-workers. You gotta do it through a spirit of love. Because until they truly see who Jesus is, they're not gonna want it. I want it to be said about about the church. When people think of that, they can say, that's a place that's like a family. That's a place that, 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 that I've sensed and I've experienced the love of God. And I want that to come from, not from just church members, but I want that to come from anybody who walks through that door. That truly, that this truly is the closest thing to heaven on earth. But how many of y'all know? It starts with me. And when I say that, I mean me as a person, and you need to say that too. It starts with me. And what I'm simply doing is that this is just the invitation I'm going to give out today. If you agree with me on this, and you want God to begin to just to, like never before, allow a spirit and an attitude and a lifestyle of love to just overwhelm who you are, Will you meet me up here and say, Lord, here I am. Once again, just take me. Let truly who Jesus Christ is come alive in my heart and my life. And when people see me, let them experience the love of Christ. Now, by doing that, you're not saying you've done anything wrong. You're not saying you've done it wrong in the past. So let me clarify that. But you're just simply saying, Lord, I want to be ever more like you. I want to walk in an attitude and a spirit of love. Because, Lord, there is a world that needs Jesus. And let them truly see Jesus living in me. Because I'll tell you this, because Jesus Christ himself said, he says, if I be lifted up. In other words, if we let people see who Jesus really is in our life, what did Jesus say? He says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. So the most effective witness you can be is by allowing others to see Jesus living in you. I need to shut up now. And if that's you and you agree, my, will you meet me up here? Just meet me up here. And I don't need to pray for you. Just begin to sit and say, Lord, here I am. Take my life. Use it, Lord. And if you do need prayer later on, just let me know and I'll, I'll pray for you. But it's just saying, Lord, here I am. Give me 
a heart and an attitude of love. Amen.